I think we'll begin. It's five past four. I wanted to welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming today. My name is Paul Wright. I'm the acting director of Citrus. As usual, this is sponsored by Infineon, one of our founding corporate members. So please thank them for your food. I don't quite know how you do that, but just say thank you to yourself. We would like to say hello to our web viewers at the other campuses. They are at UC Merced, UC Santa Cruz, and possibly at UC Davis. I just asked Professor Sperling if they, his own colleagues were watching him, and he wasn't sure if they would be. Uh, when you came in, you were given this blue ticket. Professor Sperling has just published this wonderful book that just came out in the last week called Two Billion Cars, and it has a foreword by Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger on the front. I wanted to read one quote from the back. I, I know somewhat Robert Sokolow from Princeton University. Uh, he and Pakala are famous for the wedge diagram that many of you, I'm sure, know. It says that this book is provocative and pleasurable, far-seeing and refreshing, fact-based and yet a page-turner, global in scope but rooted in real places. The authors make a convincing case that smart consumers driving smart electric drive cars can find the critical path to a safer planet. Dr. Sperling has a very distinguished research record, and he's the director of, and founding director of the Institute of Transportation Studies at Davis. And I think you'll agree that this very glowing praise from a very distinguished professor from Princeton is one of the best ways to introduce him to the podium. Would you please join me with a round of applause? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I actually did my PhD just across the street in McLaughlin Hall. So uh, it's, uh, it is like coming home here, almost. <laughs> um, this book really did just come out three days ago. In fact, it's not even available on, uh, on Amazon.com for two more days. So this really is a sneak preview of the book. And it was a project that was supposed to be a one-year project. And as many of you understand about these book projects, it turned into a five-year project. And so this is a special feeling for me to finally have this out here. So, uh, so this is, uh, and this is my first talk I've given since the book came out. So this is uh, also special for that reason. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about is transportation and transportation as it relates to energy and climate change and some of the changes and transformations of transportation that many of us read about, think about, experience in our everyday life. So these are just, you know, since, uh, since I have a lot of slides and a lot of ideas, let me lay out for you a preview of what I'll be talking about so this is not a, a mystery to you. And I'm going to talk basically about the dramatic changes are needed in fuels, in vehicles, and the transportation itself if we're at all serious about some of our goals of reducing oil use and greenhouse gases from transportation. We're really talking about transformations that most people really have trouble getting their head around. The direction of change is well understood, but and even some of, the end, uh, some of the end states. But the big question is, how do we get from here to there? And so I just, just this morning, I came across the, a quote from the Herb Stein, the economist. He was head of uh, Clinton, and, or not Clinton, uh, uh, Carter, and no, a couple of presidents, Council of Economic Advisors. And he said, he had this quote, things, can't go on for, things that can't go on forever don't. You know, a typical statement by an economist, right? Uh, you know, and you can think of housing prices. You know, that seemed pretty true. But if you take into it, but if you follow that philosophy, okay, eventually these corrections happen. But meanwhile, we might have some cataclysms along the way. So here we are thinking about what can we really do to make sure we don't head down this head down this path towards these. Uh, catastrophes. And we need leadership, but it's also, be, you know, all of us, you know, this is something that all of society has to embrace. We as consumers, we as citizens, as well as 
uh, the leadership. So here we go. Okay. So I'll give you, I'm going to set the stage, and then I'm going to talk about each of these so-called three legs of the stool. And, and this is a, a kind of a metaphor that we use, uh, a construct. Many of you as engineers would think of this as maybe a technology or engineering construct, the three legs of a stool, right? Vehicles, fuels, and vehicle travel. But in fact, this is a political construct. And that is because these are not equal legs of the stool, but advocates. This, this has come about because of environmental advocates that really want to emphasize the need to change our land use and our transportation system, our behavior. So they characterize this as three legs when, as I'll show you, they're uh, not equal three legs. All right, so a little context here. You know, the title of my book is Two Billion Cars, so of course I have to start out with a graph like this, and, and it's in the book. And that is, right now in the world, we're at about one billion vehicles, about 700 million cars and another 300 million other vehicles. And this, if you look at any forecast, this is what, what the fork, any mainstream forecast, this is what it looks like, that we're headed towards about uh, a, more than a doubling of it by 2025 or so. And uh, up there is a picture of a little car. I don't know if anyone recognizes that. But this is a new car being produced in India for sale at roughly $2,000 to $2,500 called the Nano. And it's part of the reason why these forecasts are likely to be accurate. And that is when you bring down the cost of the price of a vehicle and make it accessible to so many more people, they're going to buy it. And so that, that's the, the good and the, you know, it's something that's, there's good and bad associated with that vehicle. But one part of it is that it means a lot more energy use, a lot more carbon dioxide, and a lot more, <coughs> a lot more vehicle use. So if we look then on the oil side, because of these, this gr rapidly increasing vehicle use, we have rapidly increasing oil use. And so again, these are conventional, this is a conventional scenario. This is from the International Energy Agency in Paris uh, that does these kind. This is their reference ma mainstream scenario. And you see the oil <coughs> use going up. And one of the important parts of it is you see the green is OPEC, the share of OPEC, and the other is the share from all the non-OPEC sources. And the non-OPEC sources have basically peaked and are pr going to be pretty flat for a while. And because demand continues to increase, that means OPEC starts picking up a larger and larger market share, and also because they have so much oil still left. And so the red line is the market share. And what that means is more market power by OPEC and everything that that implies. So if you look at consumption of oil over the history of humanity, this is a total cumulative oil production. In 10 years, we are consuming one-fourth of all the oil consumed through our entire history. Now, obviously, this can't go on much longer, but what you see is the, the consumption keeps going up. Now, something that people don't appreciate, even some of the more, most sophisticated oil analysts, is that while conventional oil is peaking, there's something else called unconventional oil. And that's oil shale, that's tar sands, that's very heavy oils. And when you start looking at those, there's virtually an un unlimited supply of this, a huge supply, far, far more than conventional oil. And so what's happening is oil companies as, as they start uh, <coughs> reaching the, the uh, uh, finite levels, as, as production starts peaking, they start turning to these unconventional oils. And if we accept that the, these unconventional oils, you know, as being acceptable, we can stay on oil for a very, very long time. I mean, I'm talking centuries. But 
these unconventional oils are very carbon intense. It's a lot of energy to get them out of the ground, to process them. And so if we follow this path, we are essentially increasing, in some cases dramatically so, amount of the carbon that we emit into the atmosphere. And this is one image of the future of all these vehicles, all the pollution. Here's one solution of, uh, what for the traffic congestion part of the problem, but obviously this is not a solution for the energy and greenhouse gas part of the problem. So if we look at the, from a climate perspective, so what I've kind of, what I've just told you is that in terms of oil supply, there's really not a problem. In fact, at, even at 70 or $80 a barrel, there's almost unlimited supply at the, at the cost of 70 or $80 a barrel. And at $120 a barrel, there's huge, huge amounts of this stuff. But as I said, that means a lot of carbon. So now we look at it from a carbon perspective. And this is a graph from the IPCC, which received the Nobel Prize, the scientific community. And it showed the red line is business, a bus, kind of a business as usual reference case into the future. And then these gray lines are how much greenhouse gases uh, can, uh, uh, can be produced. So you see on the, on the side there, this is uh, tons per year of carbon release, carbon dioxide. And so what this shows is that if we're going to stabilize at, say, 750 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's the trajectory we'd, we would follow uh, at 550, 450, 350. Now, the scientific community says 550 is the absolute max that we can even be conceiving of. And even at that level, there's a real chance of really cataclysmic changes in the climate. And, the, and, and so the, cli the, the climate scientists are saying we really need to be aiming for 450 <coughs> parts per million. But if you look at 450 parts per million, and you see how far below that, the red line that is, that means in 2050 we're talking about a 50 to 80 percent reduction. And that's where a lot of the targets come from that you hear about and you know, the California's target and what Obama's been talking about is this 50 to 80 percent reduction. And I'm going to talk about what that means because that is not going to be easy. But now some of the scientists, Jim Hansen, one of the most prominent climate scientists, is saying actually his new calculations show that we probably really need to be aiming for 350 parts per million, and we're already at 380. So he's saying that we really need to stabilize about where we are now. And you see that graph? It actually dips down to uh, zero. <laughs> so uh, kind of hard to imagine. So here, let me talk about it now from the California perspective. So this is the, the, the gray line there is, is the business as usual forecast for California for greenhouse gases. And so you see it going up to about 600 million tons of CO2 per year by 2020. And that represents about a 28%, 30% increase above 1990 levels. And that's an important date, an important number, because California, a couple years ago, passed a law, AB 32, one of the most famous laws in California now, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. And what it says is that California will reduce the CO2 back to 1990 levels by 2020. So that represents about a 30% reduction from where we would otherwise be. And I, I would note President-elect Obama just, a few day, just last week announced that that was his target that he was going to uh, pursue for the U.S. as well. So California's plan, and so partly I'm talking, you know, actually I have two hats, and uh, Paul didn't uh, uh, mention that, but it was on my slide, and that is that I'm a faculty member, long-standing faculty member at UC Davis, but a couple of years ago, the governor uh, appointed me to be on the Air Resources Board. And the Air Resources Board is the agency in California that's been uh, designated as the agency to oversee and administer the climate policies for, for California. So I'm uh, 
involved here, both as an academic as, as well as a regulator, something that takes a little getting used to. Uh, you know, the, the, brain, the, the academic brain part of my brain and the regulatory part of my brain often clash, as you can imagine. So I even get confused saying, when I say we, sometimes we means us academics, <laughs> sometimes we means ARB, so I'll try to be more careful about that. So ARB is responsible for this. And uh, in fact, in three, in, on Thursday or Friday, on Friday this week, we will be, we, ARB, will be adopting the uh, climate scoping plan for California, basically the master plan for California for how it's going to meet that 30% reduction by 2020. And this is a very uh, elaborate template. It doesn't have all the details in it, but it lays out the cap and trade and all the other programs. So this is a hugely important action that will be taken. It's very controversial, as you can imagine. And the key features of I want to mention this. This is partly you know, speaking, again, from, with my ARB hat on and partly my public educational role. And that is that what California is trying to do in the, in the way that ARB is leading the, uh, is constructing this whole program, working very closely, I would, I would say, with many, many interest groups. I mean, you know, if those of you that get these reminders from the state about hearings, I get, I get probably, there's probably at least one public hearing a day on some aspect of this, of this plan. It's really overwhelming how much effort is going into this. But let me just, let, so these are six major features, principles, that are being pursued. The number one is stimulate innovation. And this is very relevant to Citrus. And it's the idea that we need dramatic changes in technologies, dramatic changes in behavior, dramatic changes in, in our institutions if we're going to come anywhere near not only meeting a 30% reduction by 2020, but even more importantly, that 80% that reduction by 2050. Uh, number two is a portfolio approach. You know, this is not uh, a matter of silver bullets. There's a whole lot of measures, policies, programs, technologies that are needed. And just some of the major ones for California are the whole set of energy efficiency standards, uh, renewable portfolio standard, which requires electric utilities to produce 33% of their electricity from renewable sources, the low carbon fuel standard that I'll talk about in a minute that applies to oil. Now, overlaying this whole thing is cap and trade. And if you read the newspapers, you often think cap and trade is everything. And in fact, uh, even many in Washington, D.C., when they think of climate policy, it's like they've had cap and trade, in, you know, the three words Im imprinted on their brain. And they haven't come to fully appreciate how a much richer approach is needed and will be followed. So in California's case, the cap and trade part is only about 20%. The rest of it is all these other actions. And these other actions are needed because there are so many market failures and, and market barriers that exist that the, the philosophy, the theory is that you need these specific actions to go after all of these little uh, barriers and market failures. Strong partnerships, essential, and something that the economists in the audience will be appalled by uh, is the idea of roughly proportional reductions across all the sectors. And of course, they would say you should be looking at where the costs are the cheapest, the marginal cost, and focus on those. Um, the theory is, or the hypothesis is, that in fact, we really don't know enough to be able to come up with such a sophisticated approach. And in any case, we're going to need large reductions across the board in all these sectors. At some point, we'll start relying principally or totally on price signals. But for now, we need to start getting the innovation process going in a lot of different sectors. And the other part is that you know, greenhouse gases is not everything. In fact, in many of the policies and strategies, one could argue that the CO2 reductions and greenhouse gas reductions are a small part of the, one of the smaller benefits that we're talking about, and that there are many other benefits that, that dwarf it. But the, I guess the good news, in a sense, is that there's so much public support for this, and the, there's a legal levers involved in this, 
that everyone is looking at this as, in some cases, as being the tail that wags various dogs. So this is the California approach, um, adopting the plan next in a few days. And then there'll be two years of rulemaking to actually adopt the specific details of all of them. And then all these rules and policies take, uh, take effect January 1st, 2012. And then, of course, we're off for a wild ride. So to focus on, to bring this down to transportation now, transportation is, has been specially targeted in California because it's about 40% of the total greenhouse gases. And this is higher than most other places, um, not because we drive more than anywhere else, but just because there's less energy used in other parts of our sector. We have less industry, um, we have less uh, heating that in, than a lot of other sectors, and we have less coal used in California. So for a variety of reasons, coal transportation is a big part of it and is getting a lot of attention. So back to this th th wobbly three-legged stool, <laughs> as I now call it. Um, so these are the three sectors. And, and, and you see why I call it wobbly and why it was a political construct. Because if you look there, the scoping plan, the plan is that by 2020, there'll be much more reduction gained from vehicles than from fuels or vehicle travel. So the vehicles is 40 million tons, the fuels is 15, and vehicle travel is six. So um, it doesn't say anything about importance, and it doesn't say anything about the long term, but that is the plan for the next uh, 10, 12 years as it's constructed. And we can talk, you know, when I get through this, you can start raising questions about, is this, does this approach make sense? I mean, there's lots of op-eds being written and editorials being written that say this is a dumb idea and bad approach. And so this is not something that everyone embraces as, as uh, the perfect plan. So if we look at the fuels part of it. Now, what's going to happen with fuels? We are, you know, perhaps this is a wishful statement here. Um, I say the future fuels will be eventually be a mix of biofuels, electricity, and hydrogen. And I say wishful because if you go back to that earlier graph where I said there's a whole lot of unconventional oil out there, so there is one scenario where we do that. But if we pursue that, we are really risking uh, uh, climatic catastrophes. So there's many, many fuels. Uh, you know, the most promising one fit into those three categories. And this is just a table just showing, showing doing a life cycle analysis of the full emissions from some of these uh, options. BEVs is battery electric vehicles. Uh, CNG is compressed natural gas. But you see the big ones are using biofuels, using hydrogen, and using electricity. That's where the potential is. And you know, if you think about it, we can solve all of our carbon problems by just decarbonizing our fuel. Get rid of the, get rid of the, the, the carbon, use hydrogen made from renewable sources or electricity from renewable sources or, nu or from nuclear, and voila, you know, we've gotten rid of all the carbon. So in fact, that is one plausible option for the future. And then we can drive as much as we want, have as big a car as we want, uh, and we'll all be happy. Now, if you believe that, you're very gullible. <laughs> all right, so we have this problem. So we talk about the fuels. We have this fuel du jour phenomenon that I call it, you know, meaning that there's a very short attention span by politicians and by the media. So 30 years ago is, is the sin fuels. That's what we now call un unconventional oil. 20 years ago is methanol. Battery electrics, 15 years ago. Five years ago is hydrogen. Uh, two years ago is ethanol. Now it's plug-in hybrids. And uh, what's next? <laughs> we can talk about that, too. So what we need is some kind of more durable uh, framework. Th this, is what I, you know, this is what I've learned you know, being in the, in the policy and the political world. Um, we don't really want to rely on government picking winners. Um, and you know, it's something to keep in mind as we read the news out of Washington these days uh, in terms of government getting involved. What I think we've learned in policy uh, research is that performance-based approaches, market approaches, are likely to be far more effective uh, 
in the long term. Now, market, as I mentioned, market forces and, and market policies have all kinds of issues and problems with them. And so kind of backing up one level are using performance standards. And so the low carbon, performance, the low carbon fuel standard is, is one approach for fuels. And I have to admit I have a little bias here uh, because uh, I helped head up the development of the low carbon fuel standard in California with, uh, I believe I have his picture here, uh, Alex Farrell, who you know, very tragically passed away recently. And so he was my partner as we developed. The governor asked us to develop this. And I, you know, I, as, a, as a digression, I want to mention that this has been, to me, very impressive about the governor, how he reached out to the university. And I think in many ways it's a model how, one, that universities really can work together. Alex and I worked very closely on this. We had a team of graduate students and faculty from Berkeley and Davis. I was very effective. It was, be, you know, it was in large part I credit Alex because, you know, Alex said, let's get the best people. You know, let's not work, be parochial about this and let's work together in a productive way. And, you know, that's um, unusual, let's say, in the academic world. Um, so, uh, this was, so this was uh, uh, adopted by ARB, and it's in now in a rulemaking process in March. The, the final details will be adopted. And this is turning out to be a model, uh, not just for California, but for the U.S. and the world. The European Union is, is moving towards adopting a low-carbon fuel standard also. And it's the idea that's performance-based, and there's a real, uh, a real lesson there and, uh, for other, other uh, sectors that we're talking about. So the second area is transforming vehicles. Okay, so the first part was we need to transform fuels. The second part is we need to transform vehicles. And the cars of the future need to be far more efficient. And almost definitely, most vehicles will be uh, powered by electric motors. And the question is, where does the electricity come from from that motor? And it'll come from either, most likely, either electricity from the grid or from, uh, uh, from chemical fuels that are converted by a fuel cell into electricity on board the vehicle. So um, just to kind of highlight that this is not just some academic, you know, talking, you know, in passing here. The head of Toyota 10 years ago said that, ba basically said electric drive is the future. Even General Motors, you know, General Motors eventually gets it, right? Uh, maybe that's even a, a arguable statement, but, uh, <laughs> but here's a statement that, you know, just a, a couple of years, two years ago even, General Motors, the senior management at General Motors said that, that elect, ult ultimately the, the vehicle will be electrified. Now, the first step to get there, though, is to make vehicles more efficient. And one of the really, the, the problems that plagues the automotive industry and the automotive market is that while there is a lot of innovation, in fact, the auto industry, including Detroit companies, have really been quite innovative. Uh, they've really improved the vehicles tr tremendously over the years. They've even made them much more energy efficient. The problem is all of that efficiency was used up in making the vehicles bigger and more powerful. And so this is just a graph that shows that you know, over this 20-year period from 2006, and the trend continued, is that fuel economy basically stayed flat even as the vehicles got heavier, more powerful, and much faster. So there's been a lot of progress in transforming the vehicles, and let me move on. California, you know, I just mentioned one thing. California has tried to be a leader in this area. California adopted six years ago a law to make the vehicles much more efficient, a law, that, what's become known as the Pavley Law, to impose very aggressive greenhouse gas standards on, the, on vehicles. Now, this is one of the more tortured laws in our history. Um, it's been the, law, the car companies have sued California to block it, and then California won both of the major lawsuits but then they needed a waiver from the federal government to actually adopt it. And then those of you who read, read the newspapers know that the Bush administration wouldn't grant the waiver. So then California sued, Cal sued EPA. <laughs> and so that's all in progress now. Obama has said that he will approve the waiver as soon as he gets in, but we'll see. And that will allow for a major Im uh, improvement in the vehicles. 
So we're going to see battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, fuel cell vehicles. And these electric drive vehicles are good not just because they're more efficient, but they have a whole lot of other attractions to them. You know, people are going to like the people that drive these vehicles. Almost always say they prefer them to internal combustion engines. They like the driving feel of them. They're quieter. These vehicles can be plugged back into the grid. They can be used to provide backup power to, to your homes and to local grids. So there's a whole, uh, and they can be easier to manufacture. So there's a whole slew of advantages of electric drive. And, and that's why every, car com every major car company says, this is the future. The question is, you know, exactly how does this future happen and how fast? And, and, uh, and that's a matter, uh, in part, a matter of policy and in, mar in part a matter of uh, all of us as consumers. So the, there's a very sad uh, history of electric vehicles, <laughs> sad in the sense that there was a, a development of a lot of, of these vehicles in the 90s. This is kind of my rogues gallery of electric cars from the 90s here. Uh, all of them are gone. Uh, the la this one up here is being resurrected, but basically they've all disappeared except for the one up in the left-hand corner, which is still produced by Chrysler. And you'll see some of these driving around Berkeley. In fact, there's a number of people that have them. All right, now, since there is so much enthusiasm for plug-in hybrids, um, it's you know, one of these things, you know, it's this fuel du jour phenomenon. It's like whatever the, the new best thing is, everyone embraces, it's exciting, this is the future. But the reality, and, and this is just a graph to remind me to say that, yes, there's tremendous improvement happening in batteries, but batteries are still very expensive. And if you look at, uh, uh, yeah, so if you look at, the, here's the bottom, this is the, Car, the Volt is the car that General Motors has been promoting for a few years now as the savior of the company and, and, and telling Congress that too. But this plug-in hybrid that they're using has a very large battery. It's 15 kilowatt of batteries. And the price of these right now is about $1,000. And eventually it'll come down. But you know, a question I would ask, not being too cynical or skeptical, is how many cars are they going to sell where the battery by itself adds $15,000 to the cost. And this is the car that's going to save the company. Um, it doesn't give one much faith <laughs> that uh, one, GM is being straightforward, and two, that they're, going, it, they're actually going to actually pull this off. I'm going to be done in a minute, unless it's an explanatory, uh, just a... Yeah, just the, gra the graph yeah. you put up, I didn't understand it at all. Yeah, I know, um, but I'm running out of time, so uh, I'll come back to it. <laughs> It basically shows that battery performance is improving um, and, and the new battery technology, li lithium batteries, you know, like in your laptops, the, you know, which is lithium, we've had them for a few years, have not yet made their way into cars. So cars are, the hybrid cars are still using nickel metal hydride batteries, which, you know, we gave up on in our laptops a number of years ago. But there's a big challenge in uh, upscaling these batteries to, for use in vehicles. So there's a lot of challenges. Um, and so the question is, how will these succeed? And, and one interesting idea would pose is that China now has a huge electric vehicle industry. There are electric motorcycles and electric scooters. They produced 15 million, sold 15 million of them last year. And these, you know, the quality is not great. The batteries don't necessarily long, last a long time. But they're learning fast. They're bringing the cost down rapidly. And these companies are quickly moving upscale into cars, small cars. And one has to think this is the most likely source of uh, electric vehicles in the, in the future. So I was going to uh, give GM a bad time here, but uh, everyone else does these days. You know, when I wrote the book, it wasn't so obvious <laughs> that, uh, you know, that GM w had made so many bad decisions for so many years. Uh, so these are just some of the uh, problem, some of the things they've done that are questionable, if not um, just plain wrong. Certainly, in hindsight, they were bad decisions. But even at the time, many of us were pointing out how bad these decisions were. 
So the third part, and let me just do this quickly, is transforming transportation and, and land use as we know it. And you know, vehicles are probably the easiest of these. E transforming vehicles is going to be difficult, but of these three sets of strategies, it's probably the easiest. Fuels is the next. Transforming transportation is 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 the most difficult. And there's an expression that uh, I heard a city manager from. Um, uh, from Southern California say is that sprawl is the law. And that, and fundamentally, that's the problem here. All of our rules, laws, financing is so much tied to sprawl. The fiscalization of land use where cities get a lot more money for having a car dealership than they do for putting in housing. Um, all the way to traffic engineers that have minimum standards for how wide roads need to be and how much parking there needs to be. All of it contributes to sprawl. And so we need an entire change in our mindsets, an entire change in our policies and in, our, in terms of the rules uh, about uh, financing in terms of how we uh, manage our, trans our land use, our cities and our transportation system. And California, again, is a leader. California was a leader, of course, in creating this sprawl in the first place. And so we actually know a lot more about it in California. Um, but California now has a new law uh, that was just adopted a, a couple months ago, so-called SB 375. It's a law that sets in place a process for imposing greenhouse gas targets on all the metropolitan areas in the state. And is starting this process to require metropolitan areas, local governments, to actually start using CO2, use CO2 as a metric for every decision that they make in terms of zoning, infrastructure investment, and so on. And it's just the beginning, but it actually is a step in that direction. And, a, and uh, in fact, that's probably, and it's part of that scoping plan we're voting on, and it's probably the most controversial part of it. Uh, you know, it's all the de builders and developers and, and a lot of others that are saying this is, this is the state intervening in what local government should be doing and taking away uh, the, the prerogative of local governments. So, you know, a little image to put in our mind that, you know, not all vehicle travel is high value, <laughs> you know, and we can start looking at this in terms of ways of reorganizing our transportation, our behavior. And so one last big idea that I'd like to leave with you with is this idea that, in many ways, transportation sector is the least innovative sector in our society. Maybe the only, my, my colleagues remind me, well, what about education? So, okay, well, maybe education. <laughs> but, um, but what we see here is, like, if you just look at information technologies, you know, which is what Citrus has been, you know, the mainstream technologies of uh, Citrus, we've used information technologies in transportation to make the system a little more efficient, we've, you know, we've put GPS and information technologies into our cars. Uh, highway managers use them. You know, they put up metering lights on the freeways, and, and they're doing a little bit in terms of managing the flows. But basically, it's, just in, it's a small enhancement of an existing patterns, an existing system. What we're talking about is, why not take these technologies and transform our transportation system to to, to come up with entirely new ways of, of entirely new mobility services, entirely new ways of organizing our transportation and land use system. And there are many way, ideas to do it. There's smart paratransit. You know, we have, why not be able to have these jitneys come to our house or wherever we are, pick us up, bring us where we're going. And if there's enough of these, the cost you know, per ride would, would go down. There's smart carpooling. <coughs> technically called dynamic ride sharing. The idea is that, you know, there's so many people that do go from one place to another. You know, why can't we organize ourselves a little better? You know, my teenage daughter, she does that very well, and her generation is doing that very well. I mean, they're, they're on their cell phones, and they're IMing all the time, and they're actually organizing themselves. And there, there, there are ways, there are actually companies that have started to do this that can, you know, uh, institutionalize this a little better. So there's a whole, creating a whole new system. And um, uh, a point I want to make to highlight the opportunities but also the challenges is that um, 
and this is where I get in a little trouble. You know, I, I've learned being in a regulatory policy role, you can't be quite as flippant as you are as an academic. <laughs> People actually pay attention to what you say more than they do when we're just academics. And uh, so take transit, okay? If you talk about climate change and climate policy, everyone, almost anyone would say, more money for transit, that's the solution. But in fact, buses now use more energy, produce more CO2 per passenger mile than cars do. So if all we did was just spend more money on transit, and probably if we spent more money on transit, it would actually get even worse because where transit exists now, it's, it's serving the, the most dense corridors. Um, but what's happened is that, you know, these are average, so you know, where I get in, you can tell where I can get in a lot of trouble saying these kinds of things, right? <laughs> but the reality is these are average, average uh, intensities, and they're based upon um, average situations and, and very low load factors. The transit, the buses are not used very much. So, of course, if we got more people in the buses, then the intensity would, would improve dramatically. But the point of this is that if you just put money in transit, you're, not gonna, you're probably not going to do anything for climate. So what you need is more integrated solutions. You've got to focus on the land, you know, you, what's sometimes called transit-oriented development, getting people using it more. Uh, you have to think about integrating some of these other services like car sharing, let people have access to a car when they need it, and then they'll maybe use transit other parts of the time some of the dynamic ride-sharing ideas I talked about, neighborhood vehicles where you can just use that for local purposes and then use that also connect up to transit. So there's many ideas and that's what we need is a more integrated <coughs> holistic approach. It's, it's not just technology and it's not just uh, policy, but it's changing the whole structure of our transportation system. And so, you know, this was for all the economists in the crowd, you can come back to this, but here's just, you know, I'm not just spouting off about market failures. The really, you know, and if you want to debate, we can get back into this at some point. But these are all the shortcomings in the markets, and these are the problems that we're addressing uh, by, by coming up with more specific rules for climate. And so let me close. The very last slide here is that, um, according to Jerry Brown, so, you know, I have Arnold Schwarzenegger with my book, and so I wanted to be you know, bipartisan or nonpartisan <laughs> here. Um, so here's a quote from Jerry Brown, and besides, he might be our next governor, so this mean, has uh, extra meaning. And I think what he says here is, is, is really important. And it basically just says that this is going to be really hard. And, and the, you know, if the, the scientific community is even close to being right about needing to reduce CO2, and if we're even semi-serious about dealing with oil imports and all the problems dealing, uh, that are associated with that. You know, everything from war, tensions between countries, uh, to just the price of, of fueling our vehicles. Then uh, we've got quite a challenge. And so, if you want to know more about everything I said, take a look at the book. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to, ooh, sorry. Well, then we're going to raffle this uh, wonderful, oh, we have three books to raffle, actually. And Yvette's going to pass the microphone around. Let me pass it to Sam. Thank you. Uh, um, Dan, thanks for this uh, very informative talk. But I, I would like to comment on your last slide, uh, or the one before Jerry Brown's quote, oh. <laughs> um, uh, showing transit uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think uh, even though it's written, but it needs to be emphasized, these are based on the current ridership levels and not necessarily what transit could attract. So if you, if you, were, if you had the kind of ridership levels for transit, for transit buses in U.S. cities that you have, say, in Western European countries, that blue bar for transit would go down dramatically. And so just so that nobody... Uh, I think you, you might have given the impression that you were... Uh, uh, being critical of transit as as an alternative when you probably meant to say that with the current ridership levels, transit is not the solution, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that was, and, and those numbers are for the United States also. So if you go almost anywhere else in the world, the, the numbers are far better. You know, the United States is just about the worst case situation. Okay. Um, I think you made it very clear that it's very expensive to retrofit currently sprawling cities uh, when you're approaching the transportation land use problem. However, in China and India, where we've got massively expanding cities, which haven't been built to accommodate the people, what kind of strategies are there for them to adopt good land use policies? Because this could be a very efficient way to uh, get the benefits that you're looking at. Yeah, China, China is a fascinating situation because they're growing so fast, they're motorizing so fast that, um, that uh, the urgency of doing something there is much greater in fact, because otherwise they lock themselves into patterns that are very unsustainable. And, and they already, even at car ownership rates, you know, one fortieth of what the U.S. is now, they have far more severe congestion problems. So they have a lot of incentive to do something about it. You know, they, even apart from climate, the, the amount of money going into road infrastructure is huge, uh, <coughs> transit infrastructure is huge, the oil imports are soaring, and costs are soaring, and so they have a lot of it. And, and basically, you know, those of us in the transportation profession, like SAMR, you know, all of the ideas are pretty well known. You know, for the U.S., I think bringing some of these information technologies become more important because we have this diffuse uh, land pattern. And uh, if we're going to move towards a more transit model, use transit more, collective transportation more, uh, we're going to have to come up with services that are more uh, matched better with, with this more sprawled development that we have. But in China, they've got high density, and, and they've just got to basically get their act together. But, you know, they've got education problems, they've got water problems, they've got, you know, and it's hard to tackle all of the challenges at once. But, yeah. So uh, I like to contest this innovation uh, um, I would say ideology, because if you look in the uh, history of technology, you can pretty much say that all um, future protection of innovation never turned out. So huge innovations were made, but they were never foreseen. So why can um, um, strategy not look at existing? systems that work much better in other places and like public transportation strategies that already is, exist. And my hypothesis is it's something about the US system. It's much easier to get like venture capital to waste most of the time actually. Also it's easier to waste private money than public money. So that it's the thing why all the US approaches are on a way in, uh, focus on innovation, it's a financing problem. You know, generally I would agree with you in most sectors, like in fuels or vehicles, you know, the amount of money available to car and oil companies swamps anything that government has. And it's a, it's a matter of channeling that innovation and creating, that's why I talk about market instruments and performance standards. In transportation, I get a lot of venture capitalists that come to me and they say, you know, there's all this opportunity out there, all, you know, transportation, you know, there's got to be lots of good businesses there. You know, all these kinds of things I was talking about here. The problem is that so much of it is in the public sector, and there are these institutions that resist innovations in transportation, you know, like transit operators, you know, not to pick on transit again too much. Um, but they are, <laughs> but they are, you know, for good reasons. You know, they're, they're publicly financed, heavily subsidized, and it's been very hard to uh, open up them up to new ideas like these smart paratransit ideas. And so it's, we need some kind of reform of public finance of transportation and reform of transit institutions to allow that money to flow and for the private sector to become involved because they won't, they won't put money in it now. It's not happening. Yeah, I have, it seems to me that um, crude oil is an international product, 
priced probably the same everywhere, and yet in the U.S. they're always talking about sort of a birthright of, of lower priced gasoline than anywhere else in the world. Why isn't it considered a government policy that gasoline is priced to solve a transportation problem rather than just letting all the other forms of transportation exist on their own and having a low price for gasoline in the United States? So you're, so the question is? Why, why can't there be an idea to raise taxes for gasoline in the United States to call it solving a transportation problem rather than just dealing with cars? Well, first of all, the word tax is anathema, anathema in the political system, um, just as a generalization. I actually put out the idea of a price floor for gasoline. It was actually a New York Times op-ed a couple weeks ago. And uh, I tried to call it a, 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 a surcharge, put a surcharge <laughs> on gasoline as a way of making it more politically palatable. But, you know, just, and I understand just this morning, or uh, yesterday, someone posed to Obama on Meet the Press uh, that this idea of a price floor, and price floor is the idea that, that if the price goes below a certain amount, there's a, ta a, a variable tax that brings it up to the, uh, to this targeted, you know, and the, it really would be done with oil price, not with gasoline price to tag it, to tag it to a, a global price. And he, and, and he was, you know, he was kind of skeptical of it, you know, that people uh, are already having economic difficulties and they should, you know, to impose a tax on them might not be what they want. I mean, that's a simple, you know, there's a, a much more profound answer to it, but it, it's yeah, really... Okay, it's almost the same question as the previous questioner. Everyone in the room knows that gasoline was 460 a gallon in the summer. It's now $1.80 a gallon. Wreaks havoc through all the feedback mechanisms. Do you sell the Hummer? Do you uh, buy a Prius? Do you sell your house in the Exburbs? And so on. Can you imagine that the public would accept the price floor, however you call it, uh, in the interest of stability so that people and companies can make rational decisions or they would just throw up their hands the countries in recession and uh, it's unthinkable well my cynical view is as academics we can say that and it sounds good but you know I have to say when I did the op-ed I got probably a hundred responses from around the country and almost all of them were supportive of the idea but then whenever I talked to anyone in the political arena they say dead on arrival <laughs> Um, alas. <laughs> so now we